Today, I want to talk a little bit about the topic, take the time out. And I'm going to be using as a text, uh, Jonah, the first chapter in the 17th verse, and the second chapter, the first through the 10th verse. And it says, but the Lord provided a large fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from the belly of the fish, saying, I called the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. You cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight. How shall I look again upon your holy temple? The waters closed in over me, the deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever, yet you brought me up my life from the pit. O oh Lord my God, as my life was ebbing away, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came to you, to you in your holy temple. Those who worship vain idols forsake their true loyalty. But with the voice of thanksgiving, I will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will pay. Deliverance belongs to the Lord. Then the Lord spoke to the fish and it spewed Jonah out upon the dry land. You know, um, small children are very powerful beings. In the best of cases, they get a lot of attention and care. Actually, they require a lot of attention and care. But there's one thing that makes me jealous of them. They get to sleep as much as they want when they are little. They get to take naps. You know, whenever I see a baby who won't go to sleep at nap time, I look at them and I say, you're going to want that nap someday and it's going to be too late. But there are also times when children get very high strung, just buzzing around doing stuff, going, going, going. Or there are those times when they act out, just being demanding and unruly. Since children are not spanked these days, we also often say to our children, it's time to take a time out. They have to take some quiet time, not including any, any screen time, no toys, just quiet. They can't even talk to anybody. They just have to be. That gives them some time to reflect on what they did and make some adjustment to be different when time out is over. You know, sometimes in life, it seems like adults need to be put in time out. We live our lives at a frenzied pace. We let stress build up to the point we want to scream or throw an adult temper tantrum. We push, push, and push ourselves to the point where we don't even feel connected to our own soul anymore. We need someone to tell us to take a time out before we burn out. The scripture that was read tells the story of one who was forced to take a time out. The story of Jonah is a folktale that tells the story of a prophet, but like any good folktale, it includes a message or messages that can be applied to real life situations. Some people don't like to hear any of the Bible being described as a myth or a folktale, but that's all this book was ever meant to be, a story where the realm of fantasy and reality mingle freely. Folktales still have just as much meaning, if not more so than a factual account. We know this book is thought to have originated some, somewhere between the sixth and the fourth century BCE, and as I mentioned last week, the author um, or originator is unknown. Last week, we explored the first chapter where Jonah was told by God to go to Nineveh to give its citizens a message. But since Nineveh was known as an evil city, Jonah got on a boat headed to Tarshish instead. The boat he boarded ended up in a ferocious storm. And it was discovered that the storm was because Jonah tried to run away from what God told him to do. So to tame the waters, Jonah was thrown overboard, overboard. And that's where the text for today picks up as the story continues. God sent a fish to swallow Jonah so he wouldn't drown. And although that may have been his desire to actually drown, 
God had a different plan and sent this fish to swallow him. After all that Jonah had gone through, he needed a time out. He kept trying to run away from what God wanted him, him to do. He, he needed a time out to consider his choices and see if those choices were working for him. As the text says, Jonah spent three days and three nights in the belly of a fish, which sounds pretty nasty to me, like a pretty nasty place for a time out. Let's imagine that belly of the fish. It would be dark, it would be slimy, it would be confusing, and it would be terrifying. But on a positive note, being in the fish provided protection from the surrounding sea. What else would Jonah be able to do but sit and reflect in such a situation? Perhaps like some of us, Jonah needed some solitude. But then I'm reminded of the words of Rollo May who said, Many people suffer from the fear of finding oneself alone, and so they don't find themselves at all. Being inside the belly of the fish forced Jonah to take a period of introspection. There's something interesting when you consider this fish. Ancient tradition says Jonah was swallowed by a whale. That's how many of us heard this story, if we've heard it before. That tradition originated from the Septuagint translation of the text that was created for Greek-speaking Jews in the second or third century BCE. The original Hebrew, however, does not even have a word for whale. It uses dag, which means a great fish. What's more interesting, however, is the fact that in Hebrew, words have grammatical gender. And Jonah's fish is referred to dag, which is male, in the verses in verses 1 and 17 when Jonah was first captured by the fish and then the fish is not referred to as dag again until verse 10, uh, 10 of the second chapter when the fish vomits Jonah out of onto dry land but while Jonah is in the fish it says then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish in that instance Fish is different. The word used for fish is daga, which is feminine. So the male energy captures and expels Jonah, but the female energy protects and gives space for reflection and rejuvenation. The belly of the fish becomes more like a womb where Jonah prays and reflects and reconnects with his own soul. This week, I reread most of Thomas More's book, care of the soul. And he defines soul as not a thing, but a quality or a dimension of experiencing life and ourselves. It has to do with depth, value, relatedness, heart, and personal substance. Jonah was living a surface level life where all he could see was how to get away from a difficult assignment. He was living a life of fear without being fully attached to himself at a soul level. But being in the belly of the fish gave him pause to examine the full breadth and depth of his life. Many of us have our moments of disconnection. Our lives are so busy we get caught up in work, family responsibilities, and many other obligations, and we end up feeling disconnected from our own soul. Life becomes flat and monotonous in all of its busyness. Often our lives force us to take a time out. Our own fish swallow us and cause us to take some forced time of solitude. There are aspects of being in our fish that are like Jonah's experience, slimy, dark, unexpected, and at times terrifying. As in the case of Jonah, we are sometimes forced into the situation, but we also enter a womb where we can find solitude and space for care of our souls. Again, Thomas More highlights, care of the soul is not solving the puzzle of life, quite the opposite. It is an appreciation for the paradoxical mysteries that blend light and darkness into the grandeur of what human life and culture can be. Our fish time or our time out is not here to hurt us. Although it may be painful, it may also be a time of profound positive change. When children are placed in time out, it's not to harm them, 
it's time for them to consider what happened and learn from it and to be different when time out is over. The same is true of our adult timeouts in the belly of the pitch. They are an opportunity for soulful transformation. Consider, consider this fish called COVID-19. It has impacted everyone's life. It's captured all of us. And people are tired of restrictions, but there's also an opportunity to connect with loved ones, loved ones we've been out of contact with. We have an opportunity to try something new. I saw the other day that this has been a perfect time for black women to try letting their hair grow naturally, Ma, or like Shauna, to rock a mohawk for a while. Illness is also an unwanted fish in our lives. It can help, it can be painful and frightening, but it can also help us realize that we are stronger and more resilient than we thought we were. I remember the days when I used to have to treat myself by injecting some interferon medication every week with a, a, a needle that was an inch and a quarter long. I had to do that every Sunday afternoon. The side effect was feeling like I had the flu for the next couple of days. I don't have to do that anymore since I moved to a monthly infusion, but through the injections, I realized I was stronger than I thought I was. Unemployment is, is an unwelcome fish to be swallowed by. We're used to providing for ourselves and being successful in our jobs or chosen careers, but unemployment is also a time when we can pivot we can try something different. We can learn new skill, skills. We can take time to create or reimagine our lives. This fish called relationship trouble is really a tough one. We invest our heart into a connection with another human being only to run into conflict. But times of heartbreak also create space for self-examination. We can't change the other person, but we can choose to grow ourselves. And I think the political climate fish must be a shark that has attacked our nation's integrity and care for the masses of its citizens. But even in this environment, we've seen the soul connections when we see people of all races standing up for the rights of black people in this country. The protests and the conversations, not the violence, but we are working to try to save the soul of America. There is a chance for nurture and change within the womb of the fish that swallow us. It is critical for us to embrace the good that can come from the worst of our situations. We need that now more than ever with so much stress, uncertainty, and depression in our country. I read in a recent Time magazine article that before COVID-19, 8.5% of the people in this country experience major depression. But since the pandemic, that number magnified to at least 25% experiencing major depression. And that number goes to 50% for people who have less than $5,000 in savings. In this past week, Dak Prescott, the quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys, opened up about his own bout with depression after the suicide of his brother in April. Some people criticized him for being so transparent, saying he was showing weakness and couldn't be a good leader. But showing our vulnerabilities is not weakness. That actually shows strong leadership. Suicide is another issue that makes taking time out so critical. In 2018, the National Institute of Mental Health documented 48,000 suicides which was two and a quarter times the number of homicides. I cannot find any current statistics, but I'm sure those numbers are worse since COVID-19. There is much work to do to, to eliminate any trace of stigma for mental health concerns. We need to encourage and support one another to get the help we need when we need it. There are going to be various fish in life that we will have to deal with. So we need to be ready for the challenges and the opportunities for transformation. In our text for today, Jonah entered the fish completely resistant to, resistant to what God wanted him to do. But something happened to him during his time in that womb of the fish. 
there was a positive transformation and he came out being thankful and being eager to follow where God was sending him. What happened to cause that change? Jonah did some soul work. Again, Thomas More said the aim of soul work is not adjustment to accepted norms or to an image of the st statistically healthy individual. Rather, the goal is a richly elaborated life connected to society and nature, woven into the culture of family, nation, and globe. The idea is not to be so superficially adjusted, but to be profoundly connected in the heart to the ancestors and to our living brothers and sisters in all the many communities that claim our hearts. Soul work will not heal all of our problems. It takes us from a flat surface level view of life to a richer way of living with more depth and appreciation for the complexities of life. Soul work is not about perfection. Even Jonah had a transformation, but he still has some challenges. He even lied in his prayer that he said in, while he was in the fish. He said, I called to the Lord out of my distress and he answered me. But the truth is Jonah refused to call on his God when the sailors were asking him to do so on the ship before he was thrown into the water. And even after his transformation in the belly of the fish, Jonah still came out arrogant as he compared himself to, himself to those who worship idols. This was Jonah's shadow side. And like Jonah, we all have a shadow side, but the complexities of life often add to life's death, depth. Jonah emerged from the fish still arrogant, still with flaws, but also grateful and ready to do what God wanted him to do and that was to go to Nineveh. We need to embrace all of who we are and make the best of these lives we've been blessed with. So when it comes to our own fish stories, how do we go about transformation? Some of us have tried many ways to make changes or reintroduce ourselves to our own soul. I wish I had the exact formula we need to make that sort of soul connection, but there is no blueprint for our soul's development. I'm reminded of an old Sufi parable. It says one, one day people saw a man in the street searching frantically for something and someone asked, what are you looking for? And the man replied, I've lost my key. And the helping nature of mankind kind of kicked in and so everybody joined in and tried to help him find the key. And after searching for a while, someone said, where exactly did you last see this key? And someone, and he, the man replied in a matter of fact kind of way, I lost the key in the house. Then why are you searching for it in the street? That was the obvious question to him. And he said, there is more light out here. Many of us have frantically been looking outside it for things like peace, love, happiness, and even joy as our country and our communities become more divided. It is harder to find these qualities externally. But the real value of life, the soulful part of life is not found on the outside, it's internal where we find the eternal life. That's where we find the master keys that unlock life's gifts. Things like meditation, prayer, and especially mindfulness. Mindfulness, that state of active open attention to the present. That state is described as observing one's thoughts and feelings without judging them as good or bad. There are other ways to reconnect to our own soul. Reflect on those times when you felt most powerful and most spiritually empowered. Consider what may have been missing between that time and now and get back to it. For example, what did you read? What did you listen to? I just recently went back to listening to the jazz music that feeds my soul, a little Coltrane or Marcus Miller or Earl Klug, or Stanley Clark. That in addition to gospel music helps me reconnect to what matters most, my own soul. If we practice those soulful things, we will find them to be like being in the womb like Jonah was in the fish. He was nurtured, protected, transformed and ready to do something for the benefit of the whole city. But you know what's even better than learning to manage the fish that swallow us, forcing us to take a time out? 
it's better to choose to practice good self-care and take a break before it becomes mandatory. I'm grateful for this reminder of taking time out for regrouping and transformation. Many of us have been missing an action to our own soul for a long time. The wombs of the fish of life give us a chance for reorientation and soul reconnection. So if you're in the belly of a fish right now, know that you are passing through a womb that can yield a profound positive change. It may not be what you initially planned and it may be painful or uncomfortable, but it still is of great value. Make the most of the timeouts that come our way. I agree with Ralph Waldo Emerson who said, guard well your spare moments. They are like uncut diamonds. Discard them and their value will never be known. Improve them and they will become the brightest gems Thanks for listening. in a useful life. Join us life. next week at 10 a.m. Eastern Time via Zoom. Send me an email to drkathy100 at gmail.com. That's D-R-K-A-T-H-I 100 at gmail.com. And I'll send you the information so you can join by Zoom. Well, have a great week.